thank you everyone for joining us today in what is going to be an excellent discussion about the future of NATO and a 21st century Iron Curtain. My name is Pedro Bizzano. I help manage the Democracy and Human Rights Program here at the McCain Institute. We are really pleased that you could join us today. This is the fourth in a series of conversation we have been hosting about the future of NATO, partly funded by the US NATO mission. The conversation couldn't come at a more relevant time. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has profoundly altered the European security order and ushered in what is effectively a 21st century Iron Curtain over the continent. NATO must now reconsider both its strategic confrontation with the Kremlin and how it upholds the alliance's promise of collective security. As we are the McCain Institute, we are following in the legacy of Senator McCain, and there was no greater champion of the transatlantic alliance for NATO, for the freedom and sovereignty of Ukraine, but also for Estonia and Bulgaria and other frontline states. No greater statesman talked about it as much as he did. Our two speakers can speak to all those issues, and we couldn't be more proud to have them talk with us about something that was extremely important to Senator McCain. First, we'll talk to Under Secretary for Defense Planning of Estonia, Tina Uderberg, and then with the Deputy Defense Minister of Defense of Bulgaria, Jordan Wasilov. Under Secretary Uderberg is one of the next generation leaders of the NATO Alliance. She is currently serving as the Under Secretary of Defense of Estonia, where she's responsible for defense and capability planning, among many others. She's also an expert on NATO, having worked for five years on the NATO and UN departments of the Minister of Defense and serving at the permanent mission of Estonia to NATO. Thank you so much for being with us today, Under Secretary Uderberg. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, in this panel today. And I'm very, very pleased, of course, to, to discuss those very important issues at the so crucial times, as you mentioned. So the, the war in Ukraine has been going on for three months now. Well, we all seem to agree that this full scale invasion has fundamentally changed Euro Atlantic uh, security. Well, the past few months have proven something that we here at the eastern flank of NATO will have known for, for years. Well, Putin's regime is, is not uh, ever the one to trust, uh, as in his imperialistic mindset. There is no room for cooperation based on mutual understanding or, or solid agreement. So in this mindset, he has the solution is only a brutal force. So we can conclude from, the, from this that Vladimir Putin's desire for so-called greater Russia is still very much alive. He wants to bring Ukraine under his political and military control as it happened with, with Belarus. Well, Russia's wish to recreate the, the Gold Wars, a so-called fairs of influence approach is quite evident. So the cost of Putin's mindset is a war in Europe, as simple as that. An unnecessary war based on desired rule of Russia's neighboring countries, such as um, Estonia. Well, Putin has once again demonstrated that he is prepared to use military force, including threatening the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, he's ready to take um, high risks in order to um, attain his uh, geopolitical goals. Also, even the massive and uh, somewhat unprecedented economic and, and fiscal sanctions imposed by the European Union, by the US, and by many other nations has not stopped uh, Russia's uh, actions. Well, three months, a little more than three months now. Well, it is extremely important that we do not get tired of the news about the war, that we do not get used to it, that we do not become immune or, or insensitive about it. So appropriate assistance to Ukraine must continue. It is absolutely vital. Also the, the determination, the speed and, and unity of the countries in helping Ukraine is very, very, very important. So I think one thing is clear, irrespective of the outcome of the war against Ukraine, uh, Putin's strategic objectives and Russia's posture 
vis-a-vis -vis NATO will not change, will not going to change. And as allies, we must not be afraid, but we must be ready, we must be capable, we must be determined, we must be serious to handle it. So having said all that, I am very, very pleased that the NATO's Mm, will do comprehensively uh, review its strategy uh, with the EU to, to further uh, strengthening uh, its deterrence and defense posture along its, its eastern borders. It's very, very, very welcomed. And I hope that the decisions uh, from the upcoming NATO summit in Madrid uh, will only confirm that uh, the direction and commitment is certainly uh, there. Thanks. No, that's exactly right. And in fact, uh, Estonia is the country that has provided more support to Ukraine per capita than any country in the world. So we're very happy to be speaking to you. And I wanted to pick up on something that you said. You said, we've known about this for years. And Estonia and all the Baltic nations have warned us about this for years. I'm thinking in particular of that famous speech in Hamburg by the first president of uh, post-Soviet Estonia, Leonard Murdit. Murdit. Uh, which was not only prescient, he talks about Ukraine and he talks about what will happen if we don't uh, stand up to Putin. And it also allegedly prompted a then unknown major of St. Petersburg called Vladimir Putin to stomp out. Another person who was very uh, worried about this and was dismissed as Estonia was our namesake, uh, Senator McCain. So it took, as you said, a second invasion of Ukraine for the world to understand what the Estonians and Senator McCain had been warning us about for a long time. So we can just go back to that. Can you tell us um, how that recent invasion confirmed the fears and why you were right all along? Mm, yes, correct. Well, after Estonia regained its independence, it was in 1991, there were two most important uh, goals for us, security and economic progress. Therefore, joining NATO and joining the European Union there are basically a national goals and, and main efforts for, for quite a, a number of years for us. So public support for joining NATO in 2004, uh, that's the year we gained uh, the membership in NATO, that was very high with some 70% of Estonia supporting it. Today, in May uh, 22, the percentage is, is 80. So gradually increasing and, and high support level over the years, I think it shows two very important aspects. Well, firstly, Estonia's threat assessment has remained the same well, for, for common Estonians. We are quite well aware of Russia's military capabilities, its strategic goals. We have experienced those quite personally. As you probably know, we were the, the objects of massive cyber attacks in 2007. Well, over the years, we have fought with constant Russian influence and information warfare in, in Estonia or against Estonia. So we have no illusions, really. And secondly, the, the, the high public support shows that uh, Estonian society is convinced that NATO is absolutely ready and capable of fulfilling its core task, namely providing collective uh, defense for its members. So the presence of, of NATO the presence of different allies in Estonia, the shift in, in NATO's focus since the, the annexation of Crimea that you mentioned, uh, and increasingly more detailed military and operational planning among the allies. I think all those factors confirm the relevance uh, of NATO uh, for the public. And this is very, very important. So Estonia's efforts in, in joining NATO and also NATO's courage um, back then to accept Estonia and that other Eastern European countries as members, I think it cannot be underestimated. I'm not going to say we do you so, but of course uh, we had the experience and, uh, and probably um, uh, now, uh, now we all know what, uh, what uh, Russia and Vladimir Putin is, is capable of. Yeah, but I, I might say that you did tell us so, and if we had been listening, we had been more prepared. And I, I do want to talk about why that uh, overwhelming support for NATO uh, occurred in Estonia, especially among young people, uh, a little bit later. But first, I want to transition about how those values translate to military postures 
on the ground. Um, so there's been a switch in military postures. It has been previously described as a tripwire uh, posture with a few thousand NATO troops. Uh, but now there's some more forward defense posture, as I understand it, with 1,700 troops. Um, um, the U.S. has only had 120, but more than 5,000 have rotated. Uh, 40 troops just arrived from Italy. Um, and uh, Mr. Kusti Salam just called for a second doubling of NATO troops for up to 4,000, and the U.K. did double its, its troops there. So can you talk about your evaluation of, of the NATO posture, how those values translate to to postures on the ground and why it's so necessary to have a more permanent NATO presence, not only in Estonia, but in the Baltics? Yes, thank you, sure. Well, let us begin, what is a tripwire concept? Great. Well, and what does it mean for Estonia? So simply put, if, if Russian troops uh, were to invade Estonia, in addition to Estonian troops, they come into contact with the units of some other NATO ally or allies. Well, they had a British presence right now, American ones, and so on. So essentially, that means um, if Russia is, uh, is, is also attacking another ally besides Estonia. So that is sort of a tripwire. And, and Russia must calculate that attacking Estonia is automatically a much broader issue, right? So sounds nice. For Estonia, however, uh, this means a situation where a part of Estonia will be temporarily occupied by Russian forces. Uh, military activities or so war fighting uh, is taking place on the territory of Estonia. And then NATO must collectively begin to recapture or, or liberate those occupied areas. And of course, it is almost impossible to explain in Estonia or, or to Estonians politically, psychologically, morally, whatever, that we are ready to accept that. So we don't want to be occupied and not for a very, very short um, period of time. So don't get me wrong. Of course, we are very, very uh, grateful for all the allies, including the British and American soldiers and then airmen uh, who are here in Estonia or in the Baltic region in different formats right now and who have been rotating here for, for years. We have learned a lot from each other, the cooperation, uh, mutual understanding, integration, I think it all has reached to, to a whole new level. But however, looking at the map, a geography and a military logic is quite clear. So Estonia and, and other Baltic states remain directly exposed to a potential military threat uh, from Russia, right? Russia's forces can be massed on Russia's western border, Estonia and eastern border on a short notice. Furthermore, there's a very critical time forces distance gap between a possible deployment of superior Russian forces and the buildup of substantial um, allied forces for reinforcement uh, purposes. So having this window of opportunity regarding time and distance is quite easy for Russia to launch a preemptive attack with the aim of some land grabs uh, while stressing nuclear options. So NATO will be facing a very difficult situation of nuclear escalation. So now, forward defense. Forward defense as a concept stand on quite different strategic understanding. So we are talking about deterrence by denial. So in a military sense, that would mean clearly assigned uh, combat capable uh, division size formations for each Baltic country. And that will combine three elements. So national home defense forces, uh, Estonia has two brigades, well-trained, well-equipped, ready to fight. Secondly, allied in place forces but militarily uh, reasonable levels. So we are talking about mechanized brigade being uh, rotationally in Estonia with you know, C2 elements. And thirdly, immediate reinforcement forces and also the pre-positioned equipment and ammunition for those. So this, this three layer model will give us uh, a result an integrated allied division ready to fight from day one due to the knowledge of the local regional environment 
um, with robust operational plan and of course routine exercising. So such a militarily solid solution would significantly reduce the risk for Russia's miscalculation, right? And uh, I think it will make attacking the politics uh, for, for Russia, for Putin, just too costly. And uh, Estonia will not be uh, occupied, not even for a, for a second. So that's why we need a, a solid and militarily a more mm, meaningful uh, presence in Estonia. Thank you. Thank you for that. And it serves for our audience to explain how you think of these things on the ground and for other countries in the region. And in fact, as you mentioned, right now, uh, the hedgehog exercise is happening in Estonian Latvia. There's 15,000 troops. It's the largest exercise since 1991. Um, and then in the next month, we have the Ramstein's legacy, which is happening. And what's important to know about these things is that they were planned before Russia's invasion, right? And they're always defensive. Um, so maybe you can speak a little bit about that, but also uh, you recently said that um, this year's defense spending in Estonia is largest than Estonia's annual defense budget, right? So it's it's both the coordination outside with all the allies and these exercises, but also the, the spending uh, inside the country. So can you speak about how those two things uh, work together and how Estonia is leading the way in spending not only money on its own defenses, coordinating with NATO allies, and at the same time providing more weapons and more support to Ukraine than other, any other country in the world? Yes, indeed, we are taking it very, very seriously. And uh, while well, talking about the, the funding, well, Estonia has fulfilled its commitment to NATO to allocate at least 2% of GDP mm, to military defense from uh, 2015 already. So, and as you mentioned, this year, the government has already twice, uh, two times, decided to provide significant additional funding for defense in order to deliver additional capabilities quickly and increase also the ammunition stocks. And not only for the military uh, part, but also the, the uh, wider societal resilient uh, part as well. So, and as you also mentioned, the similar developments have taken place in Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and in many countries in, in Europe. And I think this shows once again that countries in, in such strategically difficult area do not want to be just consumers of, of uh, security. So as the threat is so existential, well, our history and an ongoing war in Ukraine have proven that once again, the existence of a solid uh, national defense capability is extremely important. So this is clearly a part of, of collective defense model. So everybody, everyone must play their part in making collective defense work. And so NATO will continue to be the strongest, uh, most successful defense alliance in the world. That's all we want. No, thank you. It, it's so good to hear um, what is happening on the ground. And I, I wanted to come back to, to, to what we talked a little bit about at the beginning, about the, the values and, and the necessity of NATO. So part of this grant is we surveyed young participants from uh, 15 different NATO countries, uh, both before and after the invasion. Uh, and some of them felt uh, that NATO was aggressive or it was partisan, right? There was all this misinformation about NATO and it took the war in Ukraine for people to understand. It wasn't surprising to us that the Estonian participant uh, was very aware, right? She, she, she knew what was happening. She understood the information war. So uh, how do you see the young generation uh, in Estonia and elsewhere thinking about NATO these days? And what message would you have for them um, as we move forward in, in this next century? Mm -hmm, right. Well, I do not think that NATO is comparable to a product or, or service that can be advertised or promoted or, or you know, uh, PR'd. Rather, I think one should understand NATO's most important essence, so its ultimate goal, if you will. It is not to wage war, but is to make peace possible. Well, NATO is a pair of, of the values that hopefully matter to us all, freedom, democracy, human rights. So it's not so much about tanks or fighter aircrafts or, or military vessels, but it's about the world we want to live in. So I myself, I was born when Estonia was part of the Soviet Union. Uh, my country was forcefully, illegally annexed to the USSR and 
I would never ever want that time uh, back. So I think no one should live in, in such autocratic uh, conditions. So the values that NATO stands for are very, very important to me. Well, now the, the misinformation part. Indeed, there are a lot of information in different challenges, challenge, and it must be remembered that some of it is biased intentionally or unintentionally. And young people today are extremely smart, but the importance of, of being source critical was, must be reminded uh, to ourselves from, from time to time. But I'm not talking so much about the possibilities of new technologies as, I don't know, deep fakes or very specifically targeted information attacks. But I really suggest a little research for, for everyone to find out what are the most common techniques uh, used by, by countries such as Russia or, or, or similar uh, in the field of information war, be it um, systematic reinterpretation of history, mixing of facts and, and lies, polarization, um, misuse of, of context and so on. So, and also increasing society's overall awareness of information warfare and, and resilience uh, to information warfare methods. I think it's, it's equally uh, a task for both authorities and uh, educational institutions, our schools. So, and if you have open, aware, respectful and a dialogue based uh, democratic society, I think that the vulnerability to information warfare is well, or will be immediately uh, reduced. Yes, that's exactly right. Media literacy and, and critical thinking and, and really evaluating your sources. And, and as, as I said, that the Estonian participant was aware of all the sources, right? She had considered how all the sources were and she had made up her own mind. Um, and it seems something in Estonia is working and has worked for a long time. Um, I, I remember uh, also, sorry to cite him so much, but Leonard Mary talked about how Europe is not a geography, right? He said it's a set of values and principle. And you just talked about those, those values, those democracy and freedom and human rights and how, how NATO is, is, is defending them. Um, and it's so good to hear uh, from you about why those values mean so much to you, having been born uh, when you were occupied by by the Soviet Union, and, and we don't want to go back to that world. So just to conclude, as we have a few minutes left, I wanted to get your thoughts on the title of this event. So we titled this event the 21st Century Iron Curtain. And of course, as you mentioned, Estonia was one of the countries behind it, right? And now it's it's in front, it's right on the front lines. And right now with the four more uh, battle groups, the entirety of NATO's eastern flank from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea is now defended by, by NATO, uh, rotating battle groups. And now with a possible addition of Finland and Sweden, of course, which would naturally increase Baltic security, as the Estonian foreign minister just said, the lines in the sand of this Iron Curtain, so to speak, seem to have been set. So as we've mentioned, the decisive conflict right now is out of Ukraine. And Estonia has provided uh, javelins and D30 122 millimeter howitzers. And of course, the president of Estonia visited Kyiv. Um, so just your evaluation on how the results of this war will consolidate or not a new Iron Curtain and what's next for, for Estonia and for NATO in the next, say, 50 years? Yes, that's a good question. Well, let me put it that way. Ukraine must win this war. They just have to. I mean, using the extraordinary will and determination of the soldiers, of the whole society, of their leadership, and with the help of, of Western equipment and ammunition you mentioned. So there's really a lot at stake, uh, not only for Ukraine, but also for Eastern Europe. Well, Europe, NATO, the overall security uh, architecture. So yeah, the, hopefully we can avoid another Iron Curtain. It's, it's not good for, for no one. But I want to comment here uh, a common uh, misconception. Uh, it is often thought um, that the war in, in Ukraine has exhausted Russia militarily and economically. So threat to the Baltics or Eastern Europe is considerably reduced. We should be relaxed. Uh, it is a very, very dangerous position, very dangerous thinking. So I think we must keep in mind that Russia is able to recover very quickly. So now is the time to think and act 
on strengthening security in, in Eastern Europe do it collectively. So I believe that NATO's clear uh, progression today means that it will continue to, to be that the strongest uh, defense organizations for that next uh, 50 years. And I hope that NATO's open door policy uh, also remain uh, in place, not only for, for Finland and Sweden, but, but also for, for another uh, or other nations as well. No, thank you for, for, for that, uh, clearing up that misconception, because we, we sometimes forget it and focus only in the short term, and we must really focus on the long term. And, and we're so glad that you're thinking about these things. And we really want to thank you for joining our discussion today. Your answers and comments were very thoughtful and insightful and strategic, just as we expected. And, and the world needs more character-driven leaders such as yourself. I, I think Senator McCain would have been proud of the work you're doing. So thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you so much as well. Thank you. Our next guest, also a next generation leader of NATO is the Deputy Minister of Defense of Bulgaria, Jordan Bozilov. He will take us from Estonia and the Baltic Sea down the entirety of the Eastern flank of NATO to the Black Sea, the lines of a possible Iron Curtain of the 21st century. Minister Bojilov currently serves as the Deputy Defense Minister of Bulgaria. He has had an illustrious career at the Ministry of Defense. He's also an expert of NATO, having represented Bulgaria in various working groups from 2005 to 2008, just after Bulgaria joined NATO. Additionally, he's the founder and first chair of the Sofia Security Forum, which has held numerous high profile conferences on NATO, as well as training the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you for being with us today, Minister Bojilov. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it is a great uh, pleasure and honor for me to have this opportunity to address uh, this session, which is uh, dedicated on such uh, uh, highly relevant topics on our common security as an alliance of uh, free and democratic nations. And I also want to commend uh, McCain Institute for International Leadership uh, for your work uh, in the field of leadership, because today we are in a dire need of leaders uh, who are visionaries and uh, who can take, uh, I would say, brave and sometimes unpopular decisions. Thank you, Minister. And, and we have seen that in Bulgaria and we're really happy that you're here. Uh, I wanted to first talk about Bulgaria's strategic place in the Black Sea. So it is said that the Black Sea is the region most affected by the tensions between Russia and the transatlantic alliance. It used to be a vibrant economic and cultural trade area. Now it's mired in the illegal Russian wars in Ukraine, Georgia, and the tensions in Moldova. In another sense, of course, the Black Sea has become a buffer between Russia and Europe. And today it's in the news because of the more than 20 million tons of grain that Ukraine cannot export through its Black Sea ports. So if you could give us your assessment of the strategic position of Bulgaria and the Black Sea, how it has changed and the role it plays together with NATO there, we would appreciate it. And any thoughts, of course, on how to break Russia's blockade of grain would be appreciated. You once talked, for example, about the brief life of the idea of creating a NATO Black Sea Fleet. Yeah, it is, of course, an issue of uh, big importance for Bulgaria, as Bulgaria is one of uh, the littoral states uh, uh, in the Black Sea. Uh, together with Romania and Turkey, uh, we are three countries uh, which represent actually NATO uh, in the region. Um, unfortunately, after uh, the Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine uh, and uh, full-fledged war uh, in Ukraine, the situation, the security situation in the Black Sea is getting more and more difficult. Uh, you see all countries experience direct uh, consequences of, of uh, this, uh, this war. Uh, actually, um, the situation uh, in Black Sea started uh, worsening years and decades ago. First, Russia occupied some part of uh, the ter some territories of uh, Georgia. It was in 2008. In 2014, Russia occupied Crimea and uh, assisted uh, uh, forces uh, in Donetsk and Lugansk, separatist forces in Donetsk and Lugansk, creating uh, um, uh, another uh, conflict zones. Uh, more, more of that, uh, Russia supported some separatist uh, uh, 
uh, organizations uh, in Transnistria uh, and other parts uh, in, uh, in uh, Black Sea. Uh, by this creating again instability in the region. Starting from 2014, Russia uh, uh, deployed uh, more and more uh, military forces and by this uh, uh, creating uh, big, uh, um, uh, I would say, uh, disbalance uh, of, uh, of military power, of course, in its own uh, favor. So I would conclude that uh, currently we have very unstable region, uh, region uh, which is um, dominated by Russian forces. That's why we have to think how to counter this uh, Russian activities uh, in the region. And of course, most importantly, how to support Ukraine uh, to, to resist Russian attack and uh, how to uh, push Russia to withdraw its forces from the territory of Ukraine. This is the only solution uh, we see now. Yes, no, thank you for that. And, and uh, we've seen your interviews calling for that and, and all you have done. Um, so I, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the history of Bulgaria, because I think it's relevant um, to, to what is happening now, not only in Bulgaria, but in other countries. So it was once considered Moscow's best friend in Europe. Uh, this was in part because of Russia's help in liberating Bulgaria from the Ottoman Empire. But it seems that the latest Russia invasion in Ukraine has altered the political calculation. Even when Russia chose Bulgaria as the first country together with Poland to cut its gas off, Bulgaria has been able to stand up to Russia. So tell us a little bit more about what you were just saying about how the war in Ukraine has changed the political winds in Bulgaria and how Bulgaria has stood up to Moscow by expelling diplomats, for example, and imposing sanctions and what this means for Bulgaria in the, in the future. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, <clears throat> perceptions uh, of Bulgarians towards Russia uh, are changing. Uh, let me first say that um, uh, historically, historically, uh, Bulgarian people had uh, a pretty positive perception of Russia, but this led uh, to a misconception that uh, Bulgaria has to be loyal, loyal to Russia. And, and there are historical roots uh, behind this, uh, this perception. Uh, during uh, and as a result of Russian Ottoman uh, wars back in 19th century, Bulgaria regained its uh, independence. And um, for many, many years uh, during the communism, um, uh, this, uh, this uh, idea of uh, uh, Russian dominance uh, over Bulgaria, of Russians' role in Bulgarian history, uh, of course, was uh, forcefully imposed uh, on, on people. So uh, this, this uh, perception of Russia as a liberator uh, persisted uh, for many years. But now we see that uh, uh, as a result of uh, aggression, Bulgarian people started uh, changing this, uh, this attitude. Uh, if uh, before, before uh, the war, I think uh, about 59% of Bulgarians had pretty positive attitude towards Putin's regime, just several weeks after the, the aggression, the number of uh, these this people has fallen to uh, about 30%, and it will continue uh, falling. Um, this is, this is uh, very important, and I'll tell you why. Because Russian propaganda uses this pretty positive attitude of Bulgarians, trying to impose uh, some, uh, um, some beliefs uh, that, uh, that Russia is the main uh, partner or the best friend uh, of Bulgarian, Bulgarian people. And through this, of course, to undermine the efforts of Bulgarian uh, government to, uh, to work together with allies uh, and friends on uh, uh, you know, pushing again Russia uh, out of, uh, out of uh, Ukraine. So I do think, I do think uh, that uh, um, the, the, the war in Ukraine, Russian aggression in Ukraine is a kind of um, uh, awakening uh, signal for, for many people, not only in Bulgaria. 
of what the regime of Putin uh, is in reality. And uh, of course, uh, this is awakening uh, bell for many people that we shall be more resilient to Russian propaganda, to, uh, to every effort of Russia to influence our societies. And I'll tell you that uh, there are many ways Russia uses uh, in Bulgaria to uh, influence uh, our decision-making process through uh, pro-Russian parties, through pro-Russian NGOs, uh, of course, uh, using some weaknesses of Bulgarian economy like dependency on, uh, on uh, Russian oil and gas. And by the way, uh, Russia uh, uh, stopped supplying uh, gas to Bulgaria and Poland uh, just recently, uh, trying to uh, develop campaign, uh, information campaign, uh, saying that uh, if would Bulgaria start paying in rubles, which is actually against EU sanctions, would resume receiving uh, Russian gas. So Russia uh, uses any attempt, any way to, to, to influence uh, Bulgarian society, to spread its propaganda, and of course, uh, trying to, uh, uh, to, to influence Bulgarian decision-making decision process also as a NATO and uh, EU mem member, trying to make it as a weak point of this organization. But I can tell you, it will never happen. Yes, no, and, and that's part of, of the leadership that we talked about at the beginning. And I wanted to see if you could tell us about the leadership of NATO, because part of, of Bulgaria's a uh, history is, is is the history of, of characters such as President Peter Stoyanov or Georgi Parvanov or Salomon Posse, right? This 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 long period in which Bulgaria was trying to join NATO and the pro-European and pro-NATO forces. So I, I wonder if you can tell us about both the leadership in Bulgaria that has brought it close to Europe and, and leadership such as yourself. You've had a long career in the defense ministry. You joined in 1992. Um, and and I, when I was researching this, I saw there was a three-year debate in the parliament, and then it took 11 years for, for Bulgaria to join. So tell us about the leadership that has happened in Bulgaria, yours and others, uh, to, to both uh, understand the, the, the values of democracy and freedom that we were fighting for, but also uh, confronting the Kremlin and all this misinformation wars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, this year Bulgaria uh, celebrated its uh, 18th anniversary as uh, a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, and we, we consider that by joining NATO uh, back in 2004, uh, Bulgaria has made a civilizational choice uh, to become part of an ally alliance uh, based on shared values and goals. Uh, and believe me, believe me, it was not, uh, not an easy decision at that time. Uh, uh, majority of Bulgarian population uh, was uh, against uh, NATO membership of NATO. Uh, many reasons uh, for that. Uh, first, uh, Bulgarian uh, population uh, as, as a result of uh, dominance of the Communist Party was, was trained and uh, influenced uh, by uh, communist and anti-NATO propaganda. Um, uh, so in, 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 in many ways, decision to join NATO was a result of, uh, I would say, uh, brave political decisions. Uh, it was a result of, uh, uh, of activities of uh, uh, really visionaries, uh, political, political leaders uh, of Bulgaria at, at that time. So uh, they, 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 they were fully, fully aware of what NATO means for Bulgarian future uh, and uh, what uh, NATO means for Bulgarian, uh, for Bulgarian people. Um, and uh, they also uh, envisaged that NATO membership in NATO would be just the first step into the process of association to EU, which uh, happened uh, actually actually later. But um, again, uh, 
it was not not uh, an easy decision, uh, but uh, due to due to uh, visionaries uh, and brave politicians uh, we had at that time, Bulgaria now is a reliable member, uh, both in NATO and the European Union. Uh, Bulgaria actively participate in NATO decision making process. Um, Bulgaria is modernizing uh, its armed forces according to the NATO standards. Uh, Bulgaria actively participates in NATO missions uh, and operations. Uh, and of course, we rely, we rely uh, on uh, NATO uh, for our defense, uh, for our security. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we have a trust that uh, NATO uh, is a main provider of defense and security for the whole Euro-Atlantic area. Yes, thank you. And it's so good to hear and, and remember that history as Finland and Sweden are joining and as other countries, hopefully Ukraine and other countries join NATO and the EU to, to hear uh, from you how that happened. Uh, I wanted to take us back to 2015 because after the first invasion of Ukraine, you edited a volume compiling uh, speeches and materials of a conference uh, you put together. And in your chapter, you summarized uh, the recommendations of a working group. Um, and you wrote, NATO will have to develop clear and a clear and definitive approach to the Eastern flank. So when I read these from 2015 and Senator McCain's speeches, I feel that they could have been written today, right? We, we have the sense of prescience and, and it's eerie how much uh, it's, it's relevant to today. So I was wondering if with the creation of the four new multilateral battle groups, which now cover the entirety of the Eastern flank, um, do you think this is a, a first step toward a clear and definite approach to the Eastern flank or what more could be done to consolidate that, that flank? It, it, is, it, is important, it is important question. Uh, why? Mainly because uh, uh, the countries uh, on the Eastern flank are still uh, in a transition process uh, from uh, uh, mainly, uh, mainly in technical means, uh, transition from old Soviet type uh, weapon system to a weapon system uh, uh, based on NATO standards. And also, uh, we, we, we clearly define uh, Russia as a, as, a, as a major threat. So 2014 uh, was, I would say, a turning point uh, for Russia in its uh, for, uh, for NATO and its uh, uh, um, presence uh, on the eastern flank. Uh, after the, the aggression uh, and uh, the annexation of Crimea, NATO established first four uh, uh, battle groups in Baltic countries uh, and Poland. Uh, but for the eastern flank, east or southeastern flank, the main, the main uh, reinforcement of NATO was just to uh, uh, create an opportunities for training uh, and uh, the, 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 the main structure was uh, 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 just a headquarter of a multinational brigade in, in, in Romania. So this was, this was at, at that time. And I think that uh, because of NATO, uh, uh, because of uh, NATO's clear assessment of, of Russia, especially after uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine uh, uh, in February this year. NATO decided to uh, establish four, uh, four more uh, battle groups in uh, uh, Southeastern uh, European countries. And it is very important for us. One, one of those battle groups is in Bulgaria. Why it is important? Uh, first, because through through deployment of battle group, NATO shows that the alliance uh, is fully committed to the security and defense of every single country. Okay. And the second, uh, these battle groups, they provide critical defense capabilities to the countries on the eastern flank. As I said, uh, uh, there are a lot of shortfalls uh, in military capabilities uh, in the countries. Uh, on the uh, on 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 the eastern flank, why again these battle groups are important? Uh, first, they provide military capabilities, and they are led by um, military capable ally. 
which which take the responsibility of framework nation. So this 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 uh, uh, this ally uh, being France, Germany, uh, UK, United States, or as it is in case in Bulgaria, Italy, they they provide critical uh, military uh, capabilities. Uh, they also uh, give us an opportunity to to train to to increase our interoperability by this uh, 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 creating uh, uh, more opportunities to increase our own capabilities and one more issue what what i would like uh, to to share with you the presence of battle groups on the territories of the countries in the, to the eastern flank is important also uh, uh, because we need to show to our own citizens that NATO is here, that NATO is committed to our own uh, security and our um, uh, own defense. So uh, this, I think, uh, is um, uh, the role of these battle groups. Of course, of course, we rely uh, for our security and defense not only on the battle groups. We rely on. Uh, our uh, armed forces, the whole armed forces, and of course, the support of all NATO members. Battle groups, it's a great idea. It contributes to the security and defense. It contributes to the uh, increased capabilities. Uh, and to, of course, uh, it shows the potential aggression or potential aggressors uh, that NATO is here, NATO is committed to the defense uh, of every and each NATO members. Yes, thank you. And I want to commend you for writing those comments back in 2015, because I think they also provide a, a structure for NATO, right? It's, it's people like you who've worked on these issues for a long time that set up the framework for it to be ready when it happened. And of course, it was a political courage that you mentioned that shows this reality of the ground for collective uh, security. I wanted to step back a little bit and talk about the NATO narratives for the next generation. So as part of this grant, we surveyed 34 young NATO participants in 15 different countries, and, and we talked to them about their perception of NATO before and after this most recent invasion. And at the beginning, people were not really clear about the value of NATO and what it represented. Of course, everything has changed. And you at the Sofia Security Forum have also trained young leaders. So what have you seen then and now and what, what lessons should we be giving to the young leaders of tomorrow about the value of NATO uh, long after this conflict is hopefully resolved? Yeah, yeah. Um, until recently, I was president of uh, Sofia Security Forum, which is among uh, leading think tanks in, in, in Bulgaria. Uh, and one of the priorities of Sofia Security Forum was to work with young people. We, we actually, uh, one of our initiatives was uh, a summer leadership academy, uh, where we uh, uh, try to present to young people what NATO means uh, for Bulgaria, what uh, EU means for Bulgaria, uh, and uh, by the way, uh, what it means for young people. I had the opportunity to, 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 to work with young Bulgarians and I'll say it's uh, rather in, in inspiring because young people, Bulgarian youth, is very pro-European. Uh, young people perceive themselves as uh, Europeans uh, and uh, they, uh, they, they, they have this European, European identity already, uh, which does not represent by, uh, by the way, Bulgarian uh, identity, but uh, rather it's complement this. And young generation is very well educated, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it is clearly, clearly uh, uh, pro-European, meaning that uh, they accept uh, European, uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, values. Uh, I just uh, recently received um, a public uh, opinion poll uh, ordered by. Uh, NATO public diplomacy decision, and let just me uh, share with you some 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 figures about uh, the perceptions uh, and attitudes of uh, people uh, regarding NATO. Um, uh, 
majority of uh, uh, allied citizens consider the transatlantic bond, bond important for security. Average for NATO member countries, it's 81% for Bulgaria is a little bit less, but it is 70%. Uh, 64% uh, of citizens agree that their country should defend another NATO country if attacked. Uh, for Bulgaria, it's 50, more or less uh, uh, the same, a little bit less. 72% uh, agree that their country should defend uh, other NATO country if attacked. Bulgarian citizens uh, say it's 65% uh, of Bulgarian uh, citizens uh, think this is true. And 54% um, uh, of Bulgarians in general have uh, positive uh, attitude towards um, uh, towards NATO, and they would vote to remain in NATO in a referendum. Uh, the average for for uh, NATO is 62. I would say that for you, uh, EU is a little bit more favorable. Uh, uh, about 70 percent of Bulgarians have very positive attitude towards towards uh, European Union. But this shows that Bulgarians uh, are. Uh, uh, are pretty positive. Bulgaria is a uh, reliable uh, ally and a reliable partner. And what is very important, there is a clear consensus among political parties in Bulgaria that Bulgaria should stay uh, and be active member of NATO and EU. There is only one um, uh, rather small um, political party which is uh, uh, against uh, membership of Bulgaria in, in NATO. So there is a clear consensus uh, in Bulgaria and uh, there is, of course, clear Euro-Atlantic orientation uh, of Bulgarian people, especially uh, young people. Well, thank you for those fascinating statistics. Since we really see the change and people think that this is just a war and then people change their views, but it's the work of yourself and many others for many years, preparing the ground, explaining why the value of NATO is important. Uh, so thank you for, for giving us that view of what is happening in Bulgaria, which I think is, is a model for other countries uh, in the region. Now, to conclude, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the title of this event. So we titled it A 21st Century Iron Curtain. And of course, Bulgaria was one of the countries behind it, and now it's on the front lines. Um, and Bulgaria has and continues to provide technical military assistance to Ukraine. Uh, Minister Petkov uh, traveled to Kyiv to meet with President Zelensky. So what is your evaluation and how the results of the war in Ukraine will or will not consolidate an iron curtain? And what's next for Bulgaria in the coming century, let's say? It is interesting uh, uh, issue about uh, Iron Curtain. Uh, I, I, I remember that time. Uh, I was uh, young, but still remember uh, this um, uh, sense uh, of uh, imminent war between uh, two, 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 two blocks uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think that um, the blocks uh, uh, Soviet uh, and Western blocs, they were antagonistic. They were based on different values and principles and they were preparing to fight each other. Um, I don't see such an antagonism uh, currently. Um, in my uh, opinion, that the, the time of Iron uh, Curtain uh, is behind us. Uh, and um, uh, of course, the associated with Iron Curtain block division of the world is unacceptable for uh, for 21st century. Um, the, the issue, of course, is, is Russia. And the issue is uh, uh, Russia's unacceptable behavior on, on the international uh, arena. Uh, now uh, Russia is waging uh, full-fledged war in uh, Ukraine. Before uh, that, uh, Russia in, uh, invaded uh, Georgia. Um, I don't think that Russia can be assessed as reliable and trusted international actor. Um, uh, uh, I, 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 I see that uh, Russia, uh, Russia itself distance from the rest of, of Europe. Uh, on the other side, European Union, United States, other democratic countries impose sanctions on Russia. Um, and of course, precondition to, to leave the sanction will be full withdrawal from, from Ukraine. Right. 
Does this isolation consist a new uh, iron curtain? Mm, I don't know. But we have to be prepared that this situation uh, will, will, uh, will be a long lasting. So uh, Russia, Russia uh, will be kind of uh, isolated um, you know, from, uh, from, uh, from the rest of democratic uh, uh, world. I don't think uh, Russia would use military force against uh, NATO. I don't think Russia will dare to do this, but Russia will use uh, all methods, uh, all uh, uh, measures to wage a hybrid war against us. Uh, this will include uh, propaganda, this will include uh, activization of uh, pro-Russian uh, proxies uh, and pro-Russian organizations in, in many countries. Uh, this will include, of course, cyber attacks. So the, the main issue is, uh, in this situation, uh, how to resist. And I think that we have to strengthen our resilience, uh, firstly, first and foremost. To, uh, to, 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 to resist uh, Russian hybrid attacks. And of course, to help uh, our partners uh, and allies to increase their own resistance. And, uh, and I mean here, uh, countries like Moldova, Georgia, countries in, in the Western Balkans, where, where Russia will try uh, uh, to, to, to use all these methods short of, of war. Uh, by the way, we hopefully will see uh, another enlargement of NATO uh, by accessing uh, Finland and Sweden pretty soon. We very much welcome, we welcome this uh, enlargement as it will be another uh, contribution to the security uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, of Europe. And uh, again, I, I have to uh, stay clearly once again. Uh, Bulgaria is a, uh, is a strong uh, uh, ally. Uh, we, we contribute to the security uh, of NATO uh, and TU. And of course, we rely on NATO in you for our own security. No, thank you. Thank you for inserting that nuance into the title and, and for explaining um, how you're thinking about it. Um, it it's, it's, it's really nice to hear. So, so with that, thank you, Deputy Minister Borgilov, for joining our discussion today. Your answers and comments were very thoughtful, insightful and strategic, just as we expected. And the world needs more character driven leaders such as yourself. And I think Senator McCain would have been very proud of the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me and I wish you success in uh, training future leaders. As I said, uh, we desperately need real leaders. Thank you. No, it's, it's been an honor. Thank you uh, as well, you, the audience, for turning into the fourth of a series of conversations we've been hosting on the challenges and future of the NATO Alliance. Lastly, please follow the McCain Institute on Instagram and Twitter for updates on future events. Thanks for joining us.